G'day there, you're watching the Aussie BIM Guru and today we're going to be running through the start of a masterclass series on how to develop content in Autodesk Revit. Um, so how to build families essentially, which I know is quite a popular topic um, requested. Um, so we're going to start with what I see as the most important part of the process, which is actually planning out your family before you start building it. Um, and I guess a lot of people will see this session as basic in some aspects, but it's really where most people fail because uh, essentially failing to plan is planning to fail. Um, so you need to strategize how you want to build before you do. So I'm going to run through some of those ideas that I use to build families before we move on. So you'll see session one, planning it out. Session two, we actually start building a family. We use reference planes, geometry, and the constraints. In se session three, we add parameters, formulas, and codes. Uh, section four, we do some tidy up and we manage the graphical settings of the family to polish it. Um, and then there's some, more, some advanced tutorials that I'll cover later. So how to do a parametric array, uh, how to use lookup tables, um, etc. Um, some of those things might not make sense to you, but by the end of the series, my hope is that you understand all of this and be able to apply it. Um, to see those four steps more simply, um, the, the first step we're covering today is method. Uh, secondly, framework of the family. Third is the system. And fourth is the polish. Uh, so today we're focusing on planning it out. So we'll just start with what category we should use for a family, which is always quite a popular question I receive in my day-to-day -day, day -day BIM management. So if it's 2D, um, it's quite simple. Um, it's either going to be, uh, I guess, a detail item if it is at real-world scale. So this would be an actual detail component, for example, a steel section. Um, it's a generic annotation if it's at paper scale. So these could be things like tags or symbols that you don't want to necessarily change depending on the scale of your view. Um, so some families that we could use for that, if we just go to new family, I'm just going to go to the standard family templates. So these are the ones that come with Revit. And these are actually appropriate for use in most cases. Um, there's very rarely a case where I mind someone starting from this, these templates. So you've got the metric detail item family template here in the family templates folder. But then you also have one called line based and line based is a little bit different in that it gives you two points that you can stretch the family between when you go to place one. Um, all the annotation families are usually in the subfolder called annotations and also title blocks as well, which are technically uh, an annotation symbol family in category. So there's a lot of different types of annotations. There's things like call out heads and view titles, keynote tags. Um, these may not be available potentially. You may need to go back to 2014 to get this template and then upgrade it because Autodesk did stop providing this one, I think in 2016 for some reason. Um, generic tag is a good place to start for a, a basic tag. You've also got room tags, spot elevation symbols. So that's that's 2D families. Um, they're a little, bit, a little bit easier to start with than 3D. Um, so 3D hosting is probably important to understand. So how is your family gonna be hosted? Because this will influence the template you likely start with. Um, the standard template is for what I would call level-based families, um, which is the most common type of family. So a chair or a table is typically going to want to be hosted to a level of the project and then offset if required. And just uh, it's important to note these families won't cut a host. So if you wanted a sink to cut a bench, for example, you would actually need it to be a face-hosted family. So face-hosted families can be actually hosted to just any face or to specific categories of elements such as ceilings for lights and grills, uh, floors for particular elements and walls. Um, I recommend avoiding face-based families unless you really need to use them because they're harder to place in most views and they rely on their host not being deleted. It's much harder to delete a level in Revit than it is to delete, say, a floor finish. Uh, I find face-based families are always accidentally hosted to particular things as well. So only use them if you need them. Um, and then there's host based families such as doors and windows, which always have to be hosted to something such as a wall. So again, in Revit, if we go to make a new family, um, there's gonna be a few family templates, but typically most of them can start as a generic model. Um, you'll see generic models have a lot of different categories. And some of them are, again, a line based family, uh, floor, face, ceiling, roof. And these all expect things to be hosted in a particular way. So that's why it's important to pick these templates. When in doubt, the generic model template is probably the best template to start with. However, if you do know the category of Revit you want to start with, you can also begin with one of these as well. Um, say if you want to do a structural column, you would start with structural column. Um, but in most cases, generic model will get the job done, unless it's a very special type of family. So um, I guess which category should the family be is also a question I get a lot. So what category in Revit should we make things? Um, so I'm just going to cover what I see as the ambiguous categories. 
and then quickly highlight the ones that are more obvious. So casework. Um, so casework I usually use for things like benches, cabinets, uh, toilet partitions and cubicles, and joinery units such as special desks um, done by a joiner. And sometimes I do stainless steel as well, so that things like benches can be scheduled together when they're laminate or stainless steel. It's important to note that these families can be cut in the section and be shown as cut in plan as well, whereas some categories can't. And casework is usually something where you would want to cut it because it might be a joinery unit that you're showing a section through. Um, electrical equipment is typically equipment that's powered by electricity or data. Um, however, you can use specialty equipment as well if you just want to put all your equipment together in one place. I initially started my career using electrical equipment and then realized most of the time it doesn't really matter depending on how you name your families. So I've actually started using specialty equipment for most things um, now instead. So things like printers, fridges, appliances, uh, televisions, computer screens, etc. Um, your engineers may prefer that you use electrical equipment depending on who you're working with. So if you're on a major project, it might be worth talking to your engineers to see what helps them the most. Um, from there, electrical fixtures. So these are things that are fixed, such as power points, light switches, card readers, uh, controls. And sometimes you could use data if you don't want to use data devices as a category. That's because it can be easier to swap power to data uh, outlets, which happens quite a lot. You might be just trying to shortcut a change in outlet count and you want to change just a single GPO to a single data outlet. And that way you can sort of bypass having to place a fresh family because you can't change types cross category. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're picking electrical fixtures as a category. Furniture um, is literally furniture, um, chairs, tables, desks, beds, etc. Um, usually loose in most cases um, or loose-ish. So fixed down, but able to be picked up and moved around if people need to. Um, say unbolted for example. Um, typically these these can only be projected as a category so if you cut through this family it will actually show you the projected view of the family so if you cut it in section you'll see the elevation view of it so just be mindful of that when you use this category it won't behave like casework for example um, so just be, be mindful of that. But you can see here just some items I use this for typically. Um, furniture systems is a funny category um, typically I use it for what I call assembly families which are usually a bunch of elements put together that don't necessarily represent an entire room, um, such as a workstation desk with lots of options and screening um, that you can use to keep a bunch of common elements together. Um, I tend not to use the assemblies tool in Revit itself, um, rather to store these elements as a nested assembly of items outside the model in a library for use across common projects. Um, these can be for things like joinery units as well, where you have multiple fixtures and outlets in the right positions already for common use between projects and it, within a project for repetition. Um, and from there, generic models are pretty much very generic elements that don't have a logical category. Um, so these could be things like conveying systems, like escalators and, and lifts sometimes. Um, some, but usually it's when you don't know what to make it you can use this category. Um, I've also used this before for assemblies and I've sort of started leaning this way for assemblies as well, rather than using furniture systems. Again, just for being able to swap things out easily. And I've always used these for what I call room families. So something that represents a, a four-sided or a, a bound set of elements that represents room contents. Typically I've used these in health planning projects, but you could use it for say meeting rooms that wanna have all the projection screens, tables and chairs together. Um, that have maybe four handles either side of the room to adjust its size. Um, I'll probably cover this technique in another tutorial because it's quite a helpful method for controlling content in rooms. Plumbing fixtures, are, again, probably less ambiguous, but typically anything that's hydraulically serviced, uh, sinks, taps, toilets, showers, uh, etc. Um, in this case, I think that probably is quite a clear category, but worth mentioning. Specialty equipment's a, funny, a bit of a funny category. Um, I typically use it for miscellaneous equipment um, and I used to use it for equipment that didn't have servicing requirements, such as dispensers, uh, grab rails, brackets, toilet paper dispensers, shower seats. Uh, but now I typically use it for anything that I would call equipment. So even if it's a TV, a fridge, etc., I'll typically use this category for it. Again, just because it's easier to swap those items to each other um, if you're trying to place a fridge. Sometimes it's easier to copy something else that's the same category and swap it over to a new fridge, for example, instead of trying to find it from your family browser. So that, that's the main reason. Um, again, these can only be projected and not cut. 
So keep that in mind when you use this category. But I found so far equipment, you would not usually want to show cut anyway. You'd want to show it typically projected. Um, even for things like grab rails, etc., it, it's usually not a reason to show it cut. Um, so that's uh, when in doubt, uh, I guess use generic model because you can always change a category later, but just not the hosting methodology. So if I create a new family and I use the generic model category, you'll see that I'll be able to change the category once I pick it, but let's just pick the standard generic model. So in the family, if I go up to this box here for family category and parameters, you see I've got the ability to reassign a category beyond this point. I could say plumbing fixtures. And now I'm working with the plumbing fixtures family. And you'll see like my object styles are also associated now to plumbing fixtures. So you can cycle your category to suit. Um, and that will work for most things. It, it works for things such as doors, but the one thing it won't do, for example, is it won't give you a wall to host it. The door is still just a, a free hosted element. There is no host for it. It's a level hosted family. So if you wanted to make a, a door, for example, you would actually probably want to go new family and you'd want to use the actual door template because some temp templates will give you a host to work with, such as the door category. So that wall is a part, it's a part of the family and you can't delete it. Um, likewise, if you wanted to make a face based family, you wouldn't start with generic model. You would start at the very least with generic model face based because the family will give you a surface to work upon as your host instead. Um, so you'll see if you go to its host, it says it's a face hosted family. So there's no way to turn this into a face hosted family. You can make it a work plan based family, but it's not quite the same thing. So just be mindful of that when you're picking your family's uh, template, because it's the first step and it's usually one that's very important. So I guess the next thing is just how to plan out a family. Um, this part I usually do in my head. Um, I'm mentally doing it while I plan my family out. I used to actually get a notebook out and draw these things and plan it out on paper just so I could visually do this. But I've built families so many times that this process is just naturally happening as I build. Um, but I thought I'd sort of show you an example of how this will work and um, one that we'll follow through in this, in this tutorial. So we're going to pick a, an object. In this case, we're picking the Ingrid drop, drop leaf table from IKEA essentially a table that has two fold down sides and is a fixed size. And we're going to build this family in the series. Um, we're going to also build it so it can be different sizes if need be, and also build it so its sides can actually fold as well. So not, not the most complex family, but a good example of lots of things you can do to a family. So the first thing I do in my head is I figure out how big everything is, um, what size is the family. In this case, there was actually no technical data I could get a hold of, only the assembly catalog. So I ended up taking images and roughly dimensioning and figuring out how big everything was based on those images. So you can see here just a, something I put together in Revit where I actually start measuring those elements out. You could load an image into your family as an underlay and sort of base your size off that, for example. But it's good to establish what those dimensions are and what's important. Um, from there, it's good to identify your constraints. Um, so where your major reference planes will be. So the back, the front, the left, the right, uh, top, bottom, um, so in this case, you can see top and elevation, um, the host, so the base in this case, and the origin is very important to identify because the origin is where the family will be placed when you place it in the project. So if my origin was down here, if I place the family, this my next click would place it here. But at the moment, I want to place it in the center. So it's always important to think about where your origin should be. If something's usually placed against the wall, make its origin on the back. Um, if it's just a loose element, probably the center. Keep it in mind. And as you swap families between each other, their origin will be the way that they position themselves as they get swapped. So always be mindful of that. Um, part four, we're gonna identify the parameters uh, that we wanna apply. So these are the major parameters as I'd call them. So width, depth, and height. It's usually good to make sure your, your parameters are common between families. So we will use shared parameters. So I'll show you how to do that in the next, in the, uh, sorry, the third part. Um, the, the zones that I've highlighted in blue are basically what I call my flex zones. So this is where the family can grow or change size. So the width and the depth will be variable and everything will get pulled with those parameters changing. Here I've identified a zone in the table, which is this straight segment of the legs, which is where I'll elevate the family if it gets higher. So this section will remain constant and this section will remain constant. And those two things will basically just grow apart from each other. 
it's from there it's good to think about your minor constraints so what planes or uh, lines really constrain and define how this family is positioned so you can see here i've highlighted nearly every control that i will need to constrain this family effectively and this will be really important in the next step where we actually set up all of our reference planes for our geometry and start constraining the geometry to these planes as well and i guess from there it's just is the family going to do anything special um, beyond those fundamental definitions. Um, so in this case, you can see this family will do something special. The sides will be set up so that they can be either put in the folded or the open position. So we're gonna to need to use some visibility parameters to control these conditions. You could build the family so that it, it's actually a variable fold distance. So you could set it to 45 degrees, zero, 90, but practically it doesn't make sense because it's either gonna be open or closed in the real world. And this could be something like opening a door in Revit, you may want to build your family so that you can open the leaf in 3D as well. Um, so we'll cover that as well. So the next session we're looking at is actually how to set up reference planes, uh, build geometry and constrain it to the reference plane. So we will actually start building a family instead. Uh, but this session was more about just how to start thinking about a family and make those first few steps towards it. So hopefully you'll join me for the next one. Um, it should be out shortly. And if you have any questions or comments about what I've been through today and below and any future requests, uh, feel free to let me know. And if you like what you're seeing, feel free to follow and subscribe and I'll see you on the next one. Thanks, bye.